It Ends With Us is a movie that I've never had less context for or preparation for going into, I think. Um, this is like, you know, um, what's the woman who wrote the book? I think it's Colleen Hoover. Colleen Hoover. This is like a big book, a big world unto itself. I was not prepared for this. I'm new to this, but I immersed myself in It Ends With Us this week, and I have a lot of a lot of thoughts but let's start before we get to the movie itself let's start with all this drama around the movie uh, which we are going to for you try to coherently summarize now even though the point of the drama is that it has no center and it's not it doesn't make any sense and it's just probably ultimately all publicity for the movie but here is what we here are things that we know about the movie it ends with us behind the scenes drama Um, The two camps, the two fighting camps are on one hand, we have the star of the movie, Blake Lively, and her husband, Ryan Reynolds, who we said are Hollywood's new, whether you like it or not, financially, objectively, the new power couple. They literally have the top two movies in the box office this week. And And also, like, it's not a down week at the box office. Like, this movie made 50 million opening weekend for a for off of a 20 million dollar budget. Massive success coming on the heels of Ryan Reynolds' massive success with Deadpool and Wolverine. Um, on the other hand, you have Justin Baldoni, who is w- also one of the stars of the movie and the director of the movie, and the guy who originally bought the rights to the book. He he is the one who shepherded this this thing from book to movie, start to finish. Um, and you would think that by all accounts, everybody should be getting along. The movie's doing great, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, for various reasons, um, that were first sort of picked up on by fans, it seems like there was some sort of tension between the Blake Lively, Ryan Reynolds camp and the Justin Baldoni camp. And here is the evidence that there is some sort of tension because neither of them have come out and said, had have explicitly said any shit about the other, but there has been a lot of passive aggressive things going on that people cannot ignore and that we cannot ignore. So here is what we know. Number one, uh, at the premiere of the movie, they did not, they never like posed together or like came together, which is very bizarre for the star of the movie and the director of the movie to not like be together at the premiere of the movie. They were both physically there and they can, cons- they very like conspicuously, cons- conspicuously avoided each other. So that was kind of the beginning of it. And then people started digging into the press tours and they were like, oh, yeah they kind of did like separate press tours. They didn't, they weren't together for interviews. It was always Blake and usually one of the other co-stars. And then Justin Baldoni was doing his own interviews. So they were never together for the press tours. And then if you dig into their, their comments about the movie, you start to find this sort of passive aggressive shade going on. Whereas, um, lively said, um, about, about being the star and the director of the movie, She said, I mean, what, because she was asked about this, quote, I mean, what an intense job to do so many things. I just found that, I just found it to be something like, wow, I really just want to have one job at once. I was looking around like, yeah, I'm just good with acting. I really love it. I just want to do acting. And then it's basically saying like, you know, (laughs) like this guy had to do directing and acting and maybe it was too much for him. Whether, whereas for me, I was happy just doing acting. Um, but then, uh, Justin separately then said seemingly in sort of response to this, he said, um, uh, he was asked if he would, if, if there was a sequel to this movie, if, if he would direct it. And he said, you know what? I think Blake should direct the oh. sequel. I think she would actually be very good at directing it. I think I've done all that I can. And I think Blake's okay. ready to direct. Right. So these are classic like insults disguised as compliments yep. going on. Um, and then that's on top of them just never appearing together in photos or anything. Um, in addition to this, and this is like this is a this is like a new sort of like this is, we're getting into like gossip here, which I really like. This might be a new potential for for gossip. for movies, baby. This is real Just deep gossip. Not facts. Um, uh, yeah. Um, the other angle here is the Ryan Reynolds angle, which if you think Ryan is just the sort of supportive spouse and all of this, you're wrong. Um, Blake implied that Ryan Reynolds rewrote some of the dialogue for this movie and specifically rewrote some of the key dialogue for this movie. She said, and I quote, the iconic rooftop scene, my husband actually wrote it. 
And she said this to E! News uh, right on the day of the premiere of the movie. The iconic rooftop scene, my husband actually wrote it. Nobody knows that, but now you know. Okay. Number one, the movie hadn't come out yet. So okay. calling something iconic yeah. is maybe a little bit ahead of time. Okay. Uh, and Joe having seen the movie, and I'm not like, and I will tell you right now, this is like, I'm not, I didn't hate the movie. I had problems with it. There's things I liked. There's things I didn't like. The I, the rooftop scene is could not be less iconic. It's not. It's not an iconic. <laughs> was, it, was it pivotal to the narrative? Sure. Okay. All right. All right. Sure. All right, at least it was okay. pivotal to the narrative. Calling it iconic is hilarious. Sure, sure, okay. Um. But it, her saying that doesn't tell us anything about the movie, but it does start to flesh out what is probably the issue here. And so here, here is my read of probably what the root of the issue here is that you had. You have two opposing forces at work in this movie. You have this guy, Justin Baldani, who was a um, is a just like shockingly attractive person. He looks I mean, he is just like the the most sort of conventionally attractive person you could probably imagine. Wow. He's a television actor. He's been in stuff, but he also had this production company. And behind the scenes, he was oh, the he one. Is handsome. He was yeah, right. He was the one that shepherd and and the movie itself, half of the movie is about how handsome he is. That's okay. kind of like one of the main plots of the movie, uh, plot points of the movie. He shepherded this movie from he bought the rights to the book through his production company, he got it made, he directed it, he's wow. in it, right? So he now perceived this as his like movie. his movie, okay. right? He's right. And, uh, but then Blake Lively got cast in it. And this is not like, you know, uh, Gone Baby Gone era Blake Lively. This is not even Gossip Girl era Blake Lively. This is like ascendant power couple Blake Lively. I'm Taylor Swift's best friend. Yep, I, I forgot married about that. to Ryan Reynolds. I am about to take over, and I, I need a project that is going to manifest my takeover. Oh, this is a good one. She's right? smart. So Justin Baldoni's like passion project collided with Blake Lively like a list ascendant project, and that is, I think, where the crisis ultimately occurred. It, what is an inevitable crisis? It was always going to be tension on set, um, because Blake. And Ryan have their goals, and Justin has his goals, and then that's where the, all this sort of drama came out of. And there's a lot of fun little shit talking on set. My favorite story is about how um, apparently there's there, well, there's definitely a scene where Justin has to like pick up Blake in one of their numerous like loves loves romantic scenes. Um, he's got to pick up Blake, and apparently Justin Maldonado has had back problems. And so he asked, like, one of the technical advisors on the movie, like, the best way to pick up Blake to, like, like minimize the chance of hurting his back. And then Blake heard about this, and she thought that he was, like, fat shaming her or, like, or like a and so what? this apparently, so there's all this, like, little Sorry, shit that went on. Bit. But if you're looking for, if you read about this online, it's just going to be chaos, of a chaos of just of just passive aggressiveness and shit talking. This is Olivia Wilde, Florence Pugh. Yes, it is. Stuff. But it's better. It's honestly it's better. Be it's better, better than yeah, Don't yeah, Worry, good, Darling. Because okay, okay. what I'm telling you is that the root of all this, I'm guiding you to the root of all this, is that you have two people working on two different projects that are the same project. You have Blake Lively working on the project of making Blake Lively a uh, famous, a award-winning actor and a lifestyle brand influencer. And then you have uh, Justin Baldani trying to make his like passion project movie and possibly transitioning into like a like writer director kind of like, you know, star of his own movies thing. So you have two people at odds on the same project. That's where all this is coming out of. And all the little shit talking is just them fighting the war. Um, it's very entertaining though. I would recommend like reading up on all of this. Now, the problem that we run into though is that this movie, the actual movie, is ultimately an exploration of, at its heart, an exploration of domestic violence in the world of, like, rich, bougie, white culture. How domestic violence can sort of hide behind different things, right? And can can happen where you where you least expect it. But the reason you least expect it is, is because of all your sort of biases and prejudices about things, right? So there is, like, a... Meaning, this is not fucking two weeks notice with Hugh Grant and Sandra Bullock. This is not a like light romantic comedy where you can sort of war behind the set and it's all fun. They're warring behind the set on a movie that has like a strong thematic central message. So this movie is 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 
I think that's why this movie has become this big sort of cultural touchstone this last week is because you have this combination of like celebrity gossip with like a strong thematic underpinning the movie and people are trying to sort of orient their brains around how to think about this whole thing while they're seeing it. Um, and Blake Lively's getting the J-Lo treatment on TikTok this week. She's getting burned. AKA getting everybody's burned. coming out and saying, Blake, you're being insensitive. You're only caring about your lifestyle brand ambitions and your marketing ploys, and you're not getting the word out about domestic violence, which is what this movie sort of centered around. And now... And Justin's they're playing, slowly yes. tr- they're slowly yes. playing catch up on the PR. And mess. Justin seemed to be playing that that's how I think he played. That was his like, you know, card to play was that when all this shit came out about like Justin and Blake warring behind the set, and he seemed to be getting the worst of it. Everyone was siding with Blake Lively because she has the bigger fan base. His he hired like a crisis management team, literally to handle his PR around this movie. And their big move was to like make his press tour about domestic violence, domestic violence organizations, about how the movie is about domestic violence. So their moves seem to be like, we're going to focus on the themes of the movie and, and, and then sort of like get everyone's sympathy behind Justin versus Blake. So the PR tour to me, I saw the movie and Joe, I've never been, I felt like I was watching a movie like on another planet. Like I was not on planet Earth. Like I was like watching and I'm look, I'm I may you know, I look how I look and I'm the age I, that I'm at. I'm as plugged into culture as anybody. I know all the fucking shit. All I do all day is fucking be online and watch movies and TV. I was not prepared for the like experience of watching this movie. I did not know what was happening at first. I thought I was, you know, we talk about this like alternative Christian cinema that's developing. I felt like I was at like one of those movies where I was like, I'm like, I'm like at someone else's cult meeting right now. Um, Because not only was the movie sort of like culturally strange to me, the audience was like reacting more than any movie I've been at all year, more than Deadpool and Wolverine, more than Dune, more than fucking Fury Road, more than, or Furiosa, more than any, more than Twisters, anything. This audience was gasping and sighing and like, oh my God, I can't believe you would do that to her. They were reacting to every little twist and turn. But the movie itself was such a like bizarre world for me. And it took me, I'm thinking about it, In the last, you know, I've watched it last night. I've been thinking about it all night, all day. I'm going to try to boil this down for you because here's what I think is happening in this movie. You have not seen this yet, but I want you to watch this and then we'll maybe we'll we'll circle back on this next week. The plot of the movie is simple. I'll give you the plot of the movie first. It's very simple. It is this woman who comes from like a rich family in Maine. And she moves to Boston after her father's death and she opens up a flower shop and then she gets into this love triangle with a guy from her past and then a guy from her present who's like, um, and the guy from her present is a neurosurgeon who's Justin Baldoni, the director of the movie, and he's so gorgeous and handsome, but he's also um, uh, potentially um, uh, uh, abusive. He has like, like, and I'm saying potentially because the movie sort of like the rhythms of the movie don't give everything away at first. So he has like, he's he's Some red flag tendencies. There's red, thank you. He has red flags, and then there's a guy from her past, this kid who was trouble, who had sort of a troubled childhood from her hometown. Uh, who she lost her virginity to, who she, like, then reconnects with in Boston years later. And there's this sort of love triangle between, like, you know, who is she supposed to be with, who's the better pair for her, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it has a it has a sort of basic familiar plot to it. But the vibe of the movie is so bizarre and so hard to get so hard to get my head around. This is this is the way I will summarize it for you is to me, this movie epitomizes. And I don't, I, w- I want to say, first of all, I do not in any way, none of my criticisms of this movie have anything to do with, like, the realities of domestic violence. Like, I'm going to start being fairly, like, you know, uh, flippant about this movie because I don't think this movie is, is like, uh, like, appreciates the realities of domestic violence. So I'm not, like, that is, domestic violence is almost separate from this movie even though it's even though it's part of the plot of this movie because what this movie is ultimately doing to me is epitomizing and representing this white fantasy of being simultaneously 
uh, privileged and victimized of like simultaneously like enjoying all of the luxuries of white privilege and like you know we get the most we're in boston for this movie it is like you know the most gentrified boho chic version of boston you've ever seen in your life it is just flower shops and pop-up restaurants and like and like trendy bars it is like and and all of these like handsome good looking people are wearing like like novelty onesies for fun while they watch bruins games they're going to like there's a scene where like hassan minaj is like hey why don't we all get fucked up tonight? And then they just go to Lucky Strike Bowling Alley for two hours and then go home early. Like, this is such a, like, like, it is like the movie version of gentrification. I don't know how else to put it. It's just like, it is, but then within this movie, and everyone is just, like, unaccountably rich. You know, like, the apartments are gorgeous. Um, There's just, like, no one has, like, you know, it's a neurosurgeon and she owns a flower shop and I don't know where she got the money for it from and it doesn't matter. And Hassan Minaj is in tech and that's how he pays for everything. But the, like the money is just is just like accepted. Like like let's just like let's just have all the characters be rich so that they can all like so that we can sort of show off the lux- like the casual luxury of their lives. Um and then in the midst of all this, and there are like, there's like product placement for Capital One credit cards and Lucky Strike Bowling Alley. And like, and so in the midst of all of this, then they're trying to do like a domestic violence plot. And so it's like, it just sort of plays as like false. It's hard to take it seriously. And I actually think in isolation, they, they do an interesting thing with domestic violence where they, they try to, without giving me any, anything away, they try to put you sort of in the point of view of someone who's being gaslit about domestic violence. So like the revelation of how the domestic violence is working is sort of this process in the movie. And I actually think in isolation, they do that well, but putting that in the context of this, like, boho chic gentrified fucking rich kid trust fund fucking world pumpkin spice latte everything's great you know we you know you know fucking uh isn't phoebe bridgers great like there's like they're all is like the soundtrack is just this like like rich kid boho fucking bullshit thing right it's a that's a hard aesthetic to do domestic violence like like against and I think they kind of fail ultimately and it plays instead of instead of being like a realistic movie about domestic violence it plays as this like fantasy camp movie in which like white people can like have their cake and eat it too where they can sort of be victim and they can be privileged they can have all of the sort of benefits of privilege but also be sort of like victims of society as well and enjoy both things but there is ultimately sort of no cost like the guy who is the abuser in the movie he gets like a talking to but he has like no real consequences to his abuse. He doesn't suffer any real, like he just gets to keep being a successful neurosurgeon. Um, and now his hot wife is just his, his hot ex wife. Like there's no, like, but there's no real consequences to his actions. Um, so it's a movie that I think like in a way, like the movie dramatizes, like the, the drama around the movie kind of represents what the problem of the movie is, is that it wants to be two things at once. It wants to be like a career maker for Blake Lively and Justin Maldoni, but they have different career aspirations. And so the movie is trying to be like a career maker for these two stars ascendant stars but it is also realizes that like it's 2024 so we got to be like we got to have like an issue in here that we're like serious that we're serious about and so it sort of like plays out this domestic violence thing in the midst of it and it just all plays as like pretty false and artificial and hard to get on board with that being said joe here is my confession and this is this is the thing that i've like struggled to like to 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 sort of like plug into all of this. <laughs> I like cried this movie three times. 
three, I kid you not, <laughs> three separate times. You didn't tell me that yet. I did uh, not tell you. Yeah. Three separate times. Yeah, you love this movie, a dude. Physical, like a physical, you love not this like, movie. not like, not like, oh, getting like wet. Like you're fucking physical crying. tears yeah, yeah, yeah. down my down my face. Three separate times. Fuck. All right, but this good. but no, but it was not. They were never like. Each time it was not like yes, I'm uh, having an emotion. Each time it was like. I'm being like fucking it's manipulated. manipulated. It's manipulated. Manipulated. So and and I am also like primed to be manipulated because you know this. You're dumb. like <laughs> so, A, I'm dumb. Nah, no B, way. I fucking yeah. love the movies. So like give me right, all of it. Right. C, you know, ever since I've had a kid, I'm fucking cooked. A cross breeze will make me cry. Like it's like it doesn't take anything. So there's like kid stuff and kid and parent stuff in the that movie i'm nah, fucking nah, nah, done nah, nah, i'm nah, nah, done nah, 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 nah. so this is a very like and you know, you know what the crazy part is the third one was on the fucking r- drive home oh like it's stuck with no no i, I like that like but it was never a satisfying cry it was always like a like fuck off cry it was like stop doing that like of course i'm gonna cry at the dead kid shit and all this spoiler. shit no that's not a spoiler okay. but like but like you don't know what i'm talking about i don't but there is there's just like I'm kind of recommending that you go see this movie. This is, so what we <laughs> sounds like what we have here is a very interesting, yes. fun movie. Yes. That's, I'm recommending that's that you fun go to talk about. I'm because okay. I watched this last night. I, read the I am book. still wrapping my head around it. I actually like. I kind of want to like recommend that you like sneak into this movie because mm. I'm not like keen for this movie to like keep making tons of money because I think ultimately the cultural trends around it are pretty uh, fucking awful, but. In the year 2024, this is a very interesting movie to see in theaters. 